All right, welcome to today's lesson on human behavior. We're going to start by talking about what is personality. So I'll ask you a question. Are you a nice person? Now most of you, if not all of you, are probably sitting there thinking, yep, yeah, I would say I'm a nice person. And if that's the case, I would ask you, are you always nice? And again, most of you are probably saying, well, probably not all the time, especially not in the morning or right after business class. So then I might ask you a question like, well, how can you not be nice if nice is part of your personality? If you say you are a nice person, doesn't that mean, therefore, that you are nice, right? That brings us to the question of what exactly is personality. Well, personality is an individual's unique and relatively consistent pattern of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. It does not mean that you always have to express those particular feelings, thoughts, or behaviors, but the majority of the time you are reflective of those personality traits. So we need to wonder, how is personality formed? Is it nature or is it nurture? Those who think it's nature believe in the idea of heredity. So they think that personality is determined utmost and foremost by your biological factors, your DNA that is inherited from your parents. And this research is supported by the differences that we find in infants. At an early age, personality theorists say that babies have not had time to learn how to behave. They haven't had time for their natural environment or their, their, their nurturing to give an effect on how they're going to react. But that said, their behavior is innate. They've, they, they're acting in a certain way all the time. They cry when they're hungry, right? How do they learn to do that? That must be programmed in their DNA. It's also supported by the similarities of identical twins that are raised apart. So we have these identical twins with identical DNA, and at birth they have been separated, not for trial purposes, just but uh, through circumstances of life. And they're raised completely separate from each other. And researchers have been able to, to locate these types of twins and then bring them back together again. And they notice when they do so that these identical twins growing up in totally different homes, totally different cultures, totally different way of living, often have many similar behaviors and characteristics. They, they tend to choose the same style of haircuts. They choose the same style of clothes. They have the same taste, sense of humor, often the same jobs, same interests. How can that be the case if it's based on a nurture and the environment that they're brought up in? There's another uh, idea that it is more on nurture or the culture or the environment that you're in and not so much based on the heredity or DNA. Cultural theorists hold that the behavior is a function of the environmental factors and the learning that you have based on your environment. Your personality is simply a person's distinct behavior pattern that emerged over time in your response to certain situations that happen. There's two types of conditioning we have that, that can cause this. The first is called classical conditioning. And we'll take a look at a YouTube video that helps us describe exactly what classical conditioning is. Discovered a fundamental type of learning called classical conditioning. An original stimulus elicits an automatic unlearned response. Both stimulus and response happen naturally. They are unconditioned. Then a second neutral stimulus that never elicits the unconditioned response by itself is introduced just before the presentation of the original stimulus. signaling stimulus is presented alone, and a response occurs as if the original stimulus were still there, we say that conditioning has taken place. The arbitrary neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus. The reverse is all... So that's the idea of classical conditioning. The other type of conditioning we have is operant conditioning, which again, we'll learn through a wonderful video. Are you finished? Well, thank you. How thoughtful. Would you like a chocolate? Um, yeah, sure. Thanks. Oh, sorry, Sheldon, I almost sat in your spot. Did you? I didn't notice. Have a chocolate. Thank you. <laughs> You're here a lot now. doing really yes you're using 
chocolates as positive reinforcement for what you consider correct behavior. Very good. So the difference here is that instead of this, the, op the reward being given as a stimulus prior to the event that we're trying to have happen, it's given as a reward after positive behavior. And again, over time, uh, we no longer need to give that reward anymore because we have modified the behavior. So let's take a look at perception that we talked about the other day in class. Human perceptions are unique to those individuals, and those perceptions are not always going to be correct. Uh, humans tend to think that our perceptions of a situation is always correct because it is our perception. But in reality, it's unique to us to often. Our perception of, uh, of events are, are only the, what we see them, and everyone else may be seeing something slightly different. An experienced manager may view a difficult situation with an employee very differently than a brand new manager have who doesn't have experiences there before or doesn't have a preconceived notion of how that employee acts. These differences in perception often impact our behavior and overall job satisfaction. Another uh, human behavior we can take a look at is attitude. Attitude is a mental state that causes a person to respond in a characteristic manner to a given stimulus. So we might have a positive attitude, a negative attitude, and so on. We can communicate our attitudes through facial expressions, hand gestures, and other more subtle forms of body language. It's particularly important to consider attitude when it comes to workplace behaviors and satisfaction because it's the one aspect that is always completely within our control. We can control whether or not we are going to have a positive attitude towards something or a negative attitude towards something. We just have to work at doing so. This is the one that is most gives us the most amount of ability to control over perception and personality. A positive attitude is essential to career success. When you're positive, you're generally more energetic, motivated, productive, and alert. And when you're negative, you're much more likely to be lazy, uninterested, and not very productive. And this contributes to the productivity of your coworkers. If you are uh, positive and have a positive attitude, those around you often will share that same attitude as well. It's also important to notice that first impressions often have a lasting impact on other people's perceptions of you, and your attitude is a big contributing factor of those first impressions. So we all know that this uh, human behavior sometimes can be broken down or analyzed, and we try and do so by creating personality types and fitting people into a particular type of personality. One way in which we do, though, do so is through the Myers-Briggs personality type indicator, in which um, you're asked a series of questions and your answers of towards those particular questions will divide you into a set of characteristics. So you can either be considered to be extroverted or introverted, right? So are you drawn toward external stimulation and energized by socializing and being social and collaborative? Or are you more preferring independent contemplation and like solitude and working alone? Uh, are you sensing or intuitive? So do you tend to focus on the details Right, uh, and you look at you're sensing, you're looking at the, the details of things, or are you intuitive and you see the big picture uh, when you deal with problems? Thinking versus feeling. Do you tend to rely on logic and thinking, or do you rely more on emotions when you deal with decision making? And finally, judging versus perceiving. Do you prefer order and control, or do you act with flexibility and spontaneity? You then can combine all of those different personality uh, types to come up with 16 overall personality types. So for example, a mastermind is going to be intuitive, they're going to be introverted, they're going to be thinking, and they're going to be judging. We'll take a look at the characteristics of these individual personality types uh, tomorrow in class. The other type of um, an analysis tool we have is called the Lowry's True Colors. And this is the idea that our personality types are divided into four basic colors or basic personality types, right? Those who are blue tend to be highly emotional. They need to contribute and encourage others. They like to, to care about people and feelings, right? They value relationships in their life. And in the workplace, they tend to be those who are very motivating and like to interact with others. We have gold. Gold people uh, tend to value rules and authority. They have a strong sense of what is right and wrong and value family and tradition. In the workplace, they're the ones who typically provide stability and maintain organization within the company. They like to handle details and, and work hard, right? Orange people tend to be more spontaneous and adventurous. They need stimulation, excitement, right? They tend to get bored very easily. Um, they value skill and courage and resourcefulness. 
They're natural troubleshooters, and in the workplace, they often require freedom and independence in a variety of tasks to keep them interested in working hard. And finally, we have the green individual. They seek knowledge and understanding, right? Um, they always are looking for explanations and answers. They value intelligence, fairness, justice. And at work, they're the ones who are conceptual, independent thinkers. They're drawn to challenges, um, and they move towards new projects at all times.